I was going to do three builds for honor mode like my other build videos and then it occurred to me there are four people in your party I don't know why I didn't think of that. Why did I make so many videos with only three builds? Well, here is my full party setup for auto mode. Let's go. Let me know in the comments what build you're running in honor mode. But first we'll talk about the overall general party setup. Now I wanted to focus mostly on builds that work early to mid game and then can easily develop into like end game gods and that sort of have a clear evolution into my already existing build videos that I've already put out if you want to see like the end game versions. Because the real thing here is that like there's no point in me showing you like a level 12 build at like the end of act three being like this is an amazing build for honor mode when simply like getting to level 12 is like 80% of the battle, especially in honor mode. Like you can't just go from one to 12 very easily. You've got to actually get there. And like that progression element is really important in honor mode. So I wanted to focus on that for this video. So the general setup here is obviously you've got four party members. You'll have one melee character being your paladin, which is essentially like your tank, but also just an insane amount of damage dealer. And then your other three party members are mostly ranged and melee hybrids. Now a core system of this setup will be using one of these builds called the Storm Warden, which you would have seen my endgame variant of this, and their ability to create water to wet targets. When you have a wet target, they have a vulnerability to lightning and cold damage. Now we're going to use this vulnerability in these other builds as well to leverage additional damage, which is extraly important. Extraly? Is that? Extraly is a word now, okay? Extraly important in honor mode because of the amount of health that enemies have, plus they're obviously their higher armor class, just the overall complexity of honor mode. And the last character that we are using is a bard, which is a support caster ranged damage dealing hybrid using hand crossbows and the like. So we'll break down each of these builds individually. And I think we're going to start with the Storm Warden. Now this is very similar to my Storm Warden build, which I will link here for you if you want the end game version. But essentially this is like the mid early game version that'll then develop into exactly how that build was once you hear the like act three and that end game. So the main focus here is on using your meta magic, especially quick and spell to be able to create water on a turn to wet targets, like we mentioned earlier, adding lightning and cold damage vulnerability to that target. Now you can then follow up with a chromatic orb, lightning bolt once you've got it, or just witch bolt those like lightning spells to then be able to deal additional damage to them. This multi-class build is a hybrid setup between a Tempest Cleric and I'm going with a Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer here because of the extra little bit of health and AC you get from the Draconic Bloodline, which is really valuable here. You will start out your build as a Cleric and level that up to level two. At level one, you get access to Destructive Wrath, so you can then use your Channel Divinity to do maximum damage with Thunder or Lightning damage. If they are vulnerable, obviously that, that, that Lightning damage is gonna do even more actual output of damage. By the way, make sure that you change your your ability score here because we are mainly playing as a sorcerer not a cleric you want to make sure that your main like ability score for your spell mod casting modifier is actually charisma because that's the sorcerer's spell casting modifier whereas as a cleric it is wisdom so just make sure you change that in character creation or if you're going to respect shadow heart like i did just make sure you do that as well and at level two you get access to wrath of storm which will then allay as a reaction to deal lightning or thunder damage back to those targets the other benefit here as well which is like a huge hugely underrated benefit for honor mode is a spell called sanctuary which you can pick up as a cleric now what this will do is allow you to essentially have a free turn where whatever ally you pick won't be harmed or attacked by a creature they can still take damage from area spells but this will save your skin in honor mode so much now it is a bonus action so you can use it on turns with your cleric as well so you've got access to that plus a high damage setup that also then sets up damage for your other builds now for this actual like weapons and general setup i'm using all the lightning charged gear for the cleric i am using sparky points rather than the spell sparker because i actually picked that one for a different build which we'll talk about here in a little bit but i should have just picked this spell sparker because i just made a mistake and in honor mode you can not change it because you've only got the one safe all right so i can't go back and pick a different weapon from the outcome of that quest in act one but if you do complete that quest which you should obviously do in act one you should grab the spell sparker to just sort of complete this overall general setup and then as this build develops like when you hit level 12 you'll essentially just be like leveling up your sorcerer leaving your tempest cleric at two and getting all of those benefits from the sorcerer meta magic setups and everything as well 
well as you do level up. So now that the target is wet, let's throw some stuff at them. And that's where this thrower build comes into play. Now, this is a little bit different to my throwing, like throw Zerka build, but I will probably just turn Lazil into this once I get to that sort of point. But essentially what this build is, is it's just like that typical throwing build where you just like throw weapons at enemies, except I'm actually using the lightning jabber here. Now, the reason I'm using the lightning jabber is because when you throw this weapon at enemies, it actually does lightning damage. Now, as the targets that we're going to be hitting are going to be wet, going to be vulnerable to lightning damage, they'll then take additional damage from that already additional dice that gets added from the lightning damage. So it's just that a little bit extra damage you can do with this general setup. Now, the reason this build's a little different is because the lightning jabber isn't a bound weapon on its own or have that like throwing returning ability. So in very early in act one, once you hit the goblin camp, you can go to the trader and grab the returning pike. You can use that and just stay as like a barbarian setup using the engaged throw, like very similar to what we did with the max level version of this. So you can just stick with the returning pike and like the barbarian version. But what I've done here is gone with an Eldritch Knight version using this lightning jabber for that extra little bit of damage from the vulnerability that you get out of that. Now, when you're leveling up this setup, you're going to really stay as a fighter at least until level five. Now, obviously level three, because then you get the Eldritch Knight. So you can then use the bind weapon to bound your weapon to yourself. So when you throw that weapon, it'll instantly come back, which is like the main reason that you want this. Also at level five, you get a feat. So then you can add Tavern Brawler to add your strength modifier to that thrown weapon. And at level five, then you get that extra attack. So you can throw that weapon twice in that one turn, not accounting for action surge as well. Now, after that point, you can then multi-class into Barbarian and then grab the Enraged Throw. So you can make that additional throw as a bonus action. But really in the early game, you want to stay as a fighter, not only because they are a really strong class on their own in the early game, but once you've hit level three, you get the returning pike, you can then build this out and then you get the lightning jabber in act two, just near the mausoleum. So you can go and grab that as well if you wanted to use that there. I was actually using the sparky points like trident up until that point for the lightning damage benefits you get from that as well. Now, obviously there are other gear like the ring of flinging you want to grab to increase your damage or with your throne things and all of that typical stuff. But the general setup here is as you've got the returning pike and the ring of flinging for that extra dice you should be fine to set up there the last two builds are essentially either of these builds will be your playable character now we'll start with the jeweler now this is my playable character and the main reason for either of these builds is because of the high charisma now in honor mode and in any mode in general it's really important to pass dialogue checks this makes so many situations just so much easier right allowing you to skip like combat encounters entirely or like turn characters to like your side of combat encounters it just really helps with that overall like passing these encounters and getting further in the game being able to like pass them just with dialogue checks so the high charisma and that really helps plus jack of trades as well so you get that extra bit of proficiency in skills that you are proficient in so when you're building this out right from the start you'll essentially just be a bard until at least level six right for the same reason you get the feed at level four and then add this a college of swords bar you get access to that extra attack at level six so you want to at least get to level six with your bard before you spec then into a rogue and then if you wanted to play around with that you can do that later for your extra bonus action and any like that general sort of setup but in combat though this jeweler setup is really a hybrid martial range and support character right you'll be able to dish out healing as well as debuffs now one of the best debuffs you can use on a mode is heat metal this is like clutch as hell not only does it do damage but it gives the target disadvantage on their attacks they can also just drop their weapon all together which with your melee characters you can just like pick that up it doesn't cost an action to pick up a weapon so if they drop their weapon you can just pick that up and then they won't actually pick it up again right so you've got that ability to prevent enemies from attacking you with their big heavy hitting weapons if they're made of metal gear wise there isn't heaps to think about for this overall setup as long as you've got two hand crossbows like one in your main hand one in your off hand so essentially you use slashing flourish to hit two targets and then with that extra attack you use slashing flourish to hit another two targets and then you've still got your bonus action which you can attack with your offhand with that hand crossbow as well or you can heal with that bonus action or do any other various things like reapply your heat metal or something as well because you've got that flexibility and then once you've had the rogue you get that extra bonus action so you can then attack on top of that as well and obviously the stealth attacks and everything come into play there as well if you wanted to use that for surprise and that sort of a thing so lots of really good setup for combat as well as being able to support your allies and heal if needed as well as being able to pass those dialogue checks which is why i've set up my 
jeweler in that way. It is worth pointing out as well that with your ability score to lean further into dexterity rather than charisma, but still keep your charisma high because you want it for the, the dialogue checks as well as those spells that you do actually use. But the main focus for this build is on those martial skills with the hand crossbow. So dexterity is actually your primary stat here. The final build I haven't touched on too much yet because there isn't really a whole lot that you need to know about. So this is like the divine smiter essentially. Now this is just a straight paladin build with Minthara. Now the reason it's just a straight paladin build at this point is because you don't really need to respec in or multi-class into anything yet. The reason for that is because Divine Smite is just so damn strong. Now, even where I'm at at this point in sort of this mid-game sort of setup, you can see the insane amount of damage modifiers that are on these Divine Smites. Not only like the additional radiant damage you get from it, but you can use your bonus action from the Oath of Vengeance, which we are, to then add additional radiant damage with Inquisitor's Might, which only costs you a bonus action, so you can then still cast your Divine Smite in that same turn. And then on top of that, right, you can use Divine favor to then add radiant damage as well which is a concentration spell so you can then leverage some of the gear that is concentration specific for this which we are using as well so you've got a ton of radiant damage that you can not only do and i'm also using the Everburn blade which you get right in this tutorial everyone knows where that comes from now that adds a little bit of extra fire damage i've also got that ring equipped which adds additional acid damage to that you do on top of that plus because when i'm concentrating on divine value with the strange conduit ring it will add an extra 1d4 of psychic damage on top of that so you're just dealing all kinds of damage and heaps of radiant damage, which is so important for Act 2 that just having a straight Paladin is super beneficial. Now, you can turn this into like the Pactodon and like level out the Warlock to get deep and packed to get an extra attack on top of that, which I will probably end up doing as I progress through like this overall setup and, and the play style that I'm playing with Minthara here. But overall, like at this point, really just having an extra attack and being able to Divine Smite twice in one turn is kind of all you need. Like you don't need to develop it too much further that's that's as, it's as simple as that right like the paladin is so strong on its own plus being able to add all that extra radiant damage because of all the undead things that you fight in this game really makes a good difference that is my honor mode party guys let me know what you think in the comments down below what would you change what would you add what do you think about this overall setup really interested to know your thoughts but thank you guys for watching this video till the end thank you to our members for supporting the channel my name is Norza, and i hope you have a great day